Okay, so with that in mind, we're gonna switch gears uh, in our next topic, what are the long-term treatments for neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder and MOGAD? Um, for this topic, we have Anastasia, um, Anastasia um, Vishnevetsky. I got it, right? Yes. Um, from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital where she uh, is finishing her fellowship and made a horrific decision to join the faculty uh, at MGH despite counseling from those of us who know better. Um, so uh, I'll invite Anastasia uh, up to the stage to talk to us about what's going to happen in both of these conditions. Hi, everyone, and thank you to the SRNA uh, for having me here, as well as to my fabulous mentor, uh, Dr. Michael Levy. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, very small topic of what are the long-term treatments for both NMOSD and uh, MOGAD. So just to kind of take a step back, there are the acute treatments, the putting out the fire uh, for relapses with NMOSD or MOGAD, and then there's the preventative treatments, preventing the fire, preventing the relapses from occurring. And I'm really going to focus this talk on the preventative treatments. And there, I'm going to kind of break it up into two sections. So at first, I'm going to talk about the FDA-approved therapies for NMOSD. And I'm going to um, add in rituximab there just because there's also been a more recent clinical trial uh, for, of rituximab for aquaporin-4 positive uh, NMOSD. After that, I'm going to talk about the off-label therapies for uh, MOGAD. There's not an FDA-approved drug for MOGAD quite yet. Uh, and also off-label therapies for uh, NMOSD, including both seronegative uh, uh, NMOSD as well as uh, the seropositive ones. And there's a lot of overlap between the off-label therapies for MOGAD and for seronegative NMOSD, as you can see with the red uh, overlap medications all highlighted. Before I do that, I want to take a step back and just kind of uh, say a few words about how uh, we think about approaching the long-term management of uh, NMOSD uh, and, and MOGAD. So for uh, NMO attacks, typically we really fear any and all relapses because recovery can be very limited and the attacks can be very, very severe. Uh, and with minimal exceptions. Almost every patient who has a uh, syndrome consistent with neuromyelitis optica and aquaporin-4 anti antibodies will be started on a long-term preventative uh, immunotherapy. In almost no cases are we going to recommend that that therapy be discontinued as of yet. There are some cases where people have done that or needed to do that, and we'll learn more about those cases as time goes on. But as of now, long-term therapy is uh, you know, really what we do for all of these patients. In some cases of seronegative patients where maybe they've had two relapses so they uh, fit the criteria, but then they've had long-term stability, there can be a discussion about whether discontinuation uh, or changes in the management could be appropriate. For MOGAD, though, the situation's a little bit different. So a substantial proportion of patients with MOGAD might have just a single relapse. Uh, they might have a single attack and then not have another one, regardless of what we do. And so we really have to balance the uh, downsides of the immunotherapy that we give with the upsides of preventing a potential attack. So in some, there are some exceptions where we might still treat somebody after their very first attack of MOGAD. So one is if they have really significant residual disability or risk of disability with a next, uh, with a next relapse. So if they lost vision in one eye, you know, the difference between uh, losing vision in one eye and then losing vision in the second one is really, really significant. Um, if someone has really high MOG titers, that might play into the decision making or our evaluation of what the risk is. And then personal preference uh, plays, you know, a major role in all of our clinic visits as well. If someone says, I'm, you know, I want to start on a therapy because I just can't, you know, you know it's, it's so anxiety provoking to think about a possibility of a future relapse, we take that into account as well. Um, but even if patients do start on a therapy, uh, there can be a conversation in a couple of years about stopping that therapy. With all, of, with all of these conditions, there's no single right answer, and there's a lot of different therapeutic options that exist. So 
Uh, some patients have a really strong preference about whether they want an IV or subcutaneous therapy. The side effect profile uh, differs between these, and it's often really difficult to balance you know, how do you think about a really serious side effect that happens extremely rarely, um, and how does that compare uh, to a more common side effect uh, that happens uh, but that is uh, less severe. And then uh, onset of action, some of these drugs uh, take action very quickly and others take longer. Um, and again, patient preference uh, plays a huge role in all of these decisions, so there's no single right answer. So I'll start with talking uh, now about the long-term uh, treatments for NMOSD and particularly the FDA-approved uh, uh, therapies for NMOSD. So uh, in 2019, there were three major um, clinical trials for dedicated drugs for neuromyelitis optica. And uh, I really like this figure and also the name of this paper from mechanisms uh, to trials because this, uh, these three drugs really approached uh, different mechanisms that we learn in the lab about how neuromyelitis optica functions. So eculizumab is one of the, um, one of the uh, drugs that was approved and it acts on the complement pathway. Um, inibilizumab um, attacks B cells, as does rituximab, and then satralizumab uh, attacks both B cells, and, but is uh, an IL-6 receptor blocker. And so the science really led to huge breakthroughs uh, in NMOSD therapeutics. So comparing these, uh, these four different, um, different drugs, and remembering that these are the three that are FDA approved, um, at the top, that's the name of the pivotal trials that were conducted and the different mechanisms uh, that I discussed, so complement inhibition, IL-6 receptor blocking, and then uh, blocking B cells in two different ways. Uh, and there are some really impressive uh, risk reductions in relapses for all four of these uh, therapies. For eculizumab, um, and I uh, use the generic name for this. Some of you might know this uh, drug as Soliris as well. Uh, the uh, treatment arm had a 96.4% of them were relapse-free at 144 weeks compared to 45.4% uh, of patients who were on the placebo. So this is a really, really dramatic breakthrough, a dramatic drug effect. Um, for satralizumab, there are actually two trials that I'll take you through. One is Secura Sky, this one, which allowed background therapy. Um, in the aquaporin-4 seropositive uh, population, also really impressive efficacy and a little bit less effective in the overall population that included both the seronegative and the seropositive uh, patients. This is the uh, additional trial of satralizumab that didn't allow any background therapy, any other um, you know, oral medications while taking it, and it uh, also showed significant reduction in relapses, but a little bit lower, lower rates. And finally, this is the uh, inibilizumab trial that, again, showed really dramatic reduction in relapses. So 87.6% of patients uh, did not experience a relapse compared to 56.6% over that same time period. So this has been a, you know, a huge success story and something that was alluded to yesterday about how you know, getting the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica today is a really different uh, experience than uh, what it was several years ago. Uh, efficacy is not the only thing that um, is worth considering uh, when you think about these drugs, and I'll say that you know, there's really a mix of these that we use in practice. Um, eculizumab had really impressive uh, efficacy data, but it's very expensive and does require an infusion every, um, uh, at first every week for four weeks and then every two weeks after that, which can really you know, affect people's lifestyles and you know, ability to, to travel, to live their lives uh, freely. Um, it also, uh, there is an associated risk of severe meningococcal infections. Everyone has to be vaccinated against that, and um, that's something that we continue to monitor for as well. Uh, satralizumab, on the other hand, is a uh, medication that's very convenient. It can be self-administered uh, subcutaneously, so you can you know, not even have to go into an infusion center and uh, take this medication. Overall, a well-tolerated and safe medication, although, um, like all the others, also has its own uh, side effects. 
it does seem to be a little bit slower in terms of its efficacy onset, so that's something to consider as well. Uh, and in ibilizumab, uh, medium time of onset, it is a more significant immunosuppressive drug, so vaccine efficacy, something that we all think about in the context of the COVID pandemic, um, can be reduced. Um, and all of these uh, medications can increase infection risk somewhat. It's also a relatively convenient option in that you uh, go into an infusion center once every six months or so to stay on these therapies, very similar to rituximab, which some of you might be uh, familiar with. So rituximab, uh, an old mainstay, um, it is a similar medium and onset and uh, it is given as an IV infusion sometimes, rarely can even be given at home. Typically it's every six months, but different dosing regimens are available. You can monitor blood counts and give it either less frequently or more frequently. Uh, so there's four really uh, great options for neuromyelitis optica, um, in particular the aquaporin-4 positive. So these three, um, eculizumab, satralizumab, and ibilizumab, are not approved for the um, patients who don't have an aquaporin-4 antibody. So I want to now transition into talking about the long-term treatments for MOGAD and the off-label therapies for uh, neuromyelitis optica. So this kind of, uh, these additional two sections, and I'll talk about them concurrently. So to finish up the conversation about rituximab, it's a really great therapy for neuromyelitis optica. It's a really great therapy for multiple sclerosis, um, but in MOGAD, it's been a little bit less effective. Uh, there were, there's some conflicting data, um, but at least a third of patients might relapse through, um, through rituximab, even when it's kind of fully taken effect. And some uh, series, Chen et al. showed 61% uh, of patients uh, relapsing on rituximab over a longer period of time. Very different from some of those uh, relapse-free rates of, you know, in the 80s, 90% that we saw uh, earlier. And uh, one option that I've uh, seen quite a bit is if there are some cases where it's not 100% clear, is this a MOGAD case, is this an MS case, maybe we're still trying to figure that out. And so sometimes rituximab can be used in that context um, to kind of try to cover a little bit of both bases. It's also, uh, I would say, probably the most commonly used medication for seronegative uh, neuromyelitis optica. Uh, and many patients also use it for the aquaporin for positive cases. It can be uh, quick to get approval. Uh, a lot more uh, doctors are familiar with its use. It's been around for longer. Um, so it's often kind of the first, the first drug that people reach for. Um, going back a little bit in time to uh, an oral medication that's been around for a long time is azathioprine. It is a very general um, immunomodulator, immunosuppressant. It, uh, doesn't have a neuromyelitis optica or MOGAD specific mechanism. It generally uh, blocks DNA and RNA and protein synthesis and decreases overactivation of the immune system that way. But there's a few downsides to it. One is that it can take a very long time to take effect. And so during that time, you have to make a decision about whether to also in, uh, continue treating with steroids. Uh, it also requires monitoring um, and can cause low blood counts or infections, similar to many of the other medications uh, that we talked about. And uh, its efficacy is quite a bit lower, both for MOGAD and for uh, neuromyelitis optica. So um, in that same series, 59% of patients relapsed um, over time on azathioprine, um, which is, again, a pretty significant proportion. Um, other studies have found lower relapse rates, but there hasn't been any prospective randomized trial to really explore this. Uh, and there was one randomized trial in neuromyelitis optica um, comparing tocilizumab, which I'll talk about a little bit later, to uh, azathioprine, and relapse rates were higher in uh, the azathioprine group. So 67.8% of patients were relapse-free in this azathioprine group. And this, I should say, is a, uh, was a trial that was uh, done in both aquaporin for uh, positive patients and negative. So another drug that's very similar or used, kind of often talked about in the same breath as azathioprine is uh, mycophenolate mofetil. Some of you might know the drug as Celsept. Um, and this also inhibits DNA synthesis, has a very general mechanism of action, not anything in, you know, particularly honed to neuromyelitis optica or MOGAD. 
And it similarly takes several months to take effect. So again, you have to make a decision about, you know, until the patient really has the um, Cellcept or the mycophenolate mofetil on board, do you continue with steroid therapy? Um, it also uh, is dosed orally, so it's just a pill that people take. It's widely available and very commonly prescribed worldwide. Um, and there was one uh, prospective cohort study that showed really quite significant efficacy for, um, for self just so it showed just 7.4% of patients relapsing on that compared to 44% uh, on placebo in the same group. But other uh, series and reviews have shown much higher relapse rates. So the jury's still out a little bit on that data. It's often um, what we reach for for patients who want a convenient daily medication to take instead of IV infusions or uh, subcutaneous injections, um, which just goes to show how much patient preference plays a role because I think an oral medication is one of the hardest things to remember to take every, every single day. Um, for neuromyelitis optica, um, there are a lot of older studies before the advent of the new drugs that I talked about in the first part of this talk that show that it reduces relapse rate. I would say we're not really starting many, many patients on this medication today, although there are patients who have been on this for a long time and not experienced relapses who you know, choose to stay on it. So this brings me to tocilizumab. This is a drug that's an IL-6 receptor blocker, just like satralizumab, which was in those larger um, neuromyelitis optica trials. Uh, it's unlike satralizumab, which is given subcutaneously, uh, tocilizumab is given IV, typically once monthly, not always. And there is actually a subcutaneous formulation as well that's been studied. Uh, also has side effects of low, sometimes low blood counts, infections, um, diverticular perforation is a rare side effect that's been uh, described, but overall it's a well-tolerated drug. And uh, there was one case series of 10 patients who had had pretty active refractory MOGAD who showed no relapses while they were being treated with tocilizumab. Um, there is an uh, ongoing um, uh, randomized control trial of satralizumab uh, that you'll hear more about uh, over the course of the day that really uses kind of the same, um, so the same principle. Um, but for the moment, we have tocilizumab available and you can use that off-label. Uh, for neuromyelitis optica, it can also be used uh, off-label for seronegative cases. There are some um, uh, seropositive patients who might still stay on that medication as well. And the clinical trial I mentioned earlier that showed not particularly impressive um, relapse-free rates for the azathioprine group, 67.8%, showed a 91.5% relapse-free rate in the tocilizumab group. So a little bit more, uh, more evidence for, for, that, for that use. So this brings me to um, IVIG and um, so intravenous immunoglobulin therapy as well as subcutaneous um, uh, immunoglobulin therapy. So this is likely the most efficacious um, MOGAD therapy that we have available today um, uh, that outside of a, uh, a randomized trial. And uh, in a large series, 20% uh, of patients on IVIG relapsed compared to the much higher rates that we already talked about in azathioprine, rituximab, and uh, cellcept or mycophenolate mofetil. Uh, and the reduction in the relapses is seen whether you're starting the IVIG up front in newly diagnosed patients or if you're starting uh, IVIG in patients who've already had relapses on other medications. So that's relatively impressive as well. Uh, there are some variations in how you can dose the medication uh, and how frequently you administer it. And so it does seem like higher frequency and uh, higher doses are more effective, although the convenience and the side effects are a downside if you give higher doses and more frequently. The availability um, and the cost and the convenience are all a significant concern. You start off with five days of therapy, typically with IVIG, and then you have to retreat monthly. And depending on weight and dosage, that might be a retreatment that spans several days. Um, it can be given at home, but that's not always easy to arrange. Um, and subcutaneous um, IVIG uh, is another option, or subcutaneous immunoglobulin 
is an option as well for self-administration at home. But for a lot of patients, the high liquid volume can make it really hard. Essentially, after they administer it subcutaneously, they might feel a, a large um, kind of uh, rough area. Um, someone yesterday uh, described that they felt like they had a tire around their abdomen after administering um, the subcutaneous medication. So for some patients, it can work, but there are some downsides as well. There are quite a few other treatments that I haven't mentioned just in the interest of time and because we're using them a little bit less often. So mitazantrone was used in the past, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, uh, and there's a lot of other uh, therapies that are being studied and uh, will probably be discussed in the next, ther in the next sessions on uh, uh, clinical trials in MOGAD and NMOSD. So with that, um, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Hi. Are there any studies on combining medications or therapies like Cellcept and IVIG? Uh, great question. So I don't know of any combining Cellcept and IVIG specifically for MOGAD. Uh, some of the studies in neuromyelitis optica uh, did combine uh, therapies. So for example, that first clinical trial of uh, satralizumab allowed background immunotherapy, not with any immunotherapy, so rituximab was not allowed but uh, for example, azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil were. So from that, you could potentially extrapolate to, you know, based on mechanism, um, that that, you know, would give you a little bit of an idea about com combining, you know, mycophenolate mofetil and let's say tocilizumab as well. Um, there's more case reports of people um, talking about combining those, but there's really not a lot of kind of really high quality data on combination um, approaches. Hi, uh, Julia Leffler from the MOG Project. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the subcutaneous IG. Um, while if, if people may have problems with um, it being under the skin, there are ways to go around that for anybody who's interested. Um, you can ask for more needles, and so that's spread over a larger portion of your body. So for instance, they normally give you four, so you might have four large places that it's under the skin. You can ask for as many as you want and spread it out, so like on your thigh or in your stomach, so you don't have that large tire. <laughs> Great, and I also should uh, credit Julie with giving me that uh, quote on the large tire, so thank you. <laughs> Hello, I have some questions from the online audience. Uh, yeah, well, one is, which of these drugs are approved in Europe, if any? That is a great question. I actually am not sure. Um, I don't know if someone else in the audience, uh, if I can phone a friend if someone knows what's approved in Europe. That's a, where in Europe is the question, indeed. I think this comes from the UK. The question comes from the UK, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so for, um, in Europe, uh, it, it's country by country specific and health system by health system specific. And so um, my understanding is uh, in the UK, you can get access to these drugs via the national health system, but you have to have advocacy from one of the centers that's certified to prescribe it. Um, and so my understanding is they're all available. And actually, Michael Yamin's here. I don't know if you have better information than I do. But in the UK, it's through that system. Um, my understanding is they are all approved. So uh, from a, the EMA, which is the European version of the FDA, they've all passed and are approved. But access is based on the health system you're in. Michael, is that fair? Is that, yeah. yeah. I just was going to add to Ben's point that, you know, every country has its own methods for review and approval of different drugs. I think many of the three the, uh, drugs that are approved in the United States are approved in many countries worldwide, but maybe Cheryl or Shervin might want to comment on um, those particular drugs. 
So I just want to um, clarify that I work for a company called Horizon, and the product we market is inebolizumab, um, also known as Eplesna. We were recently, uh, this year, approved in Germany and France, um, looking for multiple approvals in the EU next year, uh, as all, well as Latin America. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to the other products that are FDA approved. Shervin from Genentech. So just confirming what Michael mentioned, yes, it is approved uh, in UK and uh, I believe 77 other countries as we speak. Thank you. Any other questions? So I know that we've discussed that uh, patients with aquaporin 4 positive and MOSD are going to expect to be on treatment indefinitely. How long would you counsel a patient to expect to be on treatment with relapsing MOGAD disease? So I think it depends a lot on uh, the individual patient and their relapses. I think at um, if someone's had a second relapse, uh, we would at least do a two-year treatment, uh, treatment trial and then uh, kind of reassess at that point if the patient's had absolutely no signs of any, um, of any relapse. Maybe they've made a really good recovery. The other thing we could look at at that point is their MOG titer. That's not something that's kind of particularly guideline-based, but um, something that seems to be associated with relapse risk. So we could take all of those together with how well the patient's tolerating it and start thinking about whether after two years or so it makes sense to discontinue. But I think that um, as many different experts in you know treating MOG that you'll ask, you'll get a slightly different approach or a different um, you know, a, a different strategy, but I think that's, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily um, have, a, unless someone's had a lot of relapses, um, say, okay, you're going to be on an indefinite therapy. I would kind of reassess that after several years and look at some of those other factors. If you're NMO positive and you've been on rituxan and you're relapse free, um, and you've got these other options, would there be a point where you would say you've been on rituxan long enough and maybe it's time to try one of these other three? I would say we usually use the opposite approach of if something about the medication's not working, if you're experiencing a relapse, um, you know, or you're having significant side effects, um, then to transition or consider um, transitioning. I think if you're transitioning if, if you're on a medication that's really working for you but is you know, very inconvenient to take, that might be another reason to transition. We typically, I would say, would you know, say if something's working well, um, stick with it. There's some um, suggestion that maybe very long-term use with rituximab could lead to increased infection, but there are a lot of patients who have been on, the, on this therapy for a very, very long time and done well, so I probably wouldn't rush to, to switch to any of the new therapies if, uh, you know, if, there, if there's not a particular reason. Great, thank you, appreciate yeah. it.